Okay, so we'll move to the last part of the interview now, where we talk about different aspects of phonology. I ask you some questions uh, about theory and practice as well. You get a chance to talk about teaching phonology. Okay. Um, let's start uh, talking about intonation. Now, there are normally people talk about three areas of meaning that intonation can affect. What what would you understand those to be? Well, those would be grammar, attitude, and discourse. Okay. And I'd say that traditionally it's grammar that tends to get most of the attention when we teach intonation because it's probably to do with all the rules that are easier to explain and to identify and mm. therefore present and activate with, with students. Yeah. Can you give an example of, of grammar and intonation then? What would be an example of where intonation is used for grammar? For example, the difference between <coughs> the rising intonation in yes-no questions, such as do you agree, and um, WH questions, information questions that would normally have um, a, f a falling intonation mm. if they're asked uh, for the first time. Right, okay. And you mentioned that for the first time. What happened? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes. Uh, further distinction would be between WH questions asked for the first time with a falling intonation. What time does a train leave? Mm -hmm. And um, the same kind of questions asked with the rising intonation. To, um, to refer back to information that has been previously mentioned. That's, they have already told you what time the train leaves. You've forgotten and you're asking again, yeah. what time does the train leave? And what I've noticed with Spanish students, they tend to automatically use um, a rising intonation in WH questions, mm. irrespective of the information being uh, new or previously mentioned, right. and that okay. needs work. Good. So that's something you think you would work on. How would you work on that in class with students then? I would probably model it first in a, in a relevant context. Mm. Uh, elicit the, the, the relevant intonation for the two different cases. Probably have yes-no questions in the same context as well to point out the differences. And then um, use an activity in which the students need to ask each other questions. Kind of info gap activity. Mm so that they get to, to start activating the target language. Mm. And I would imagine it would take quite a few lessons and a lot of recycling mm. for, for this point to become active spontaneously mm. because intonation tends to be um, somewhat less susceptible to, to intervention compared to maybe grammar or vocab, at right. first sight anyway. Okay. Now, when you talked about the grammar, we sort of got sidetracked a bit there. Let's go back again. The other two uh, areas then would be... Those would be attitude and um, discourse. Okay. Attitude, something that I have done with my students, for example, um, just use a very simple question such mm -hmm. as how do you do or what time are you coming, just mm. any, anything that they would find very easy to deal with mm. and practice um, using the same question in different intonations, showing sarcasm or uh, boredom surprise, interest, so that um, they get the idea first and then mm. do uh, role plays based on, on different attitudes mm. for them to express. Okay, so that would be the attitude, we've got yeah. the grammar attitude and the third was? For discourse, now this is probably the, the least obvious area to, to work with because discourse would be any meaningful utterance, mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be closer to, to spoken um, English and it's uh, it's not as obvious for, for learners of English to understand and then what I've normally done um, has been to use either YouTube clips from sitcoms or that tend to have this sort of, of dialogues mm. and as again elicit the raise awareness elicit the different patterns of, of intonation what would be an example practice. then of discourse uh, of intonation being used to Manage um, something as simple as get it, any sugar, that out of context may not make any sense to a learner of English and they would have to rely heavily on the context around this utterance to um, infer meaning. Mm. Some people often, or well, sometimes cite lists as well as an example of discourse. What, what happens when you're kind of reading or, or giving out a list? to the intonation? Well, the, the standard pattern would be rising, rising for every item on the yeah. list and then falling on the end. And again, one thing, the one error that is quite common 
um, with learners of English is that they tend to maintain the same pattern mm. of intonation rising even on uh, the last item on the list mm. and automatically the interlocutor would expect more to come on the list, more items and mm. uh, that there is a bit of confusion. Yes. Um, a, a game that seems to work quite well for, for that in class mm -hmm. is um, a, a I went to the supermarket type of game that can be used right. for any context, not just supermarkets. And um, you can start with the first student saying, I went to the supermarket and I bought tomatoes. You know? The next one would say, I went to the supermarket and I bought tomatoes, mm -hmm. and another, another item on the list and so on. So they have to um, reassess the, the patterns of intonation every time yeah. they add a new list, Absolutely. a new item to the list. Okay, good. Let's move on now and talk about something else. Um, about connected speech, now part of the Trinity course, you look at uh, you know the different features of connected speech in English. Um, just want to ask you a few questions to see what you understand about uh, the terminology. First of all, linking. What do you understand linking to be? An example of linking would be with linking r, the r sound, mm -hmm. in um, in non-rhotic uh, varieties of English such as um, Australian or standard yeah, RP, British English, before a vowel sound. Uh, mm. That would be my brother and I. Mm. Yeah. Brother in non rotting varieties of English wouldn't have the R sound on the mm. end pronounced, yeah. but then um, mm. it is reintroduced to make the, the, the link. Right. My brother and I. Okay. And what about assimilation? What's assimilation? Well, there are two types. One of them is um, coalescent assimilation, mm -hmm. basically meaning that two sounds merge. Uh, sorry, two sounds, uh, yeah, merge together, such as in d and y in becoming j, would you, or could you. And also the second type, anticipatory um, assimilation. One sound changing its quality mm -hmm. because of the following sound. Um, an example would be mm -hmm. good boy. Or fat boy, the t assimilating to p in front of um, b. Does this? I mean, you've explained very well the you know the the nature of the, the, what those two things are. How does that help you, if at all, with your teaching? I mean, does it influence your teaching at all that that kind of uh, theory? It it does in in two different ways. What um, can be expected from from the the learners to produce, and mm. also what. I could do to help them uh, improve their comprehension yeah. because uh, what tends to happen is the learners will expect to hear exactly uh, what um, the, the sounds that a word would have in isolation and then when confronted with um, connected speech they, they're unable to match mm. the words to the sounds they actually hear mm. and I think raising awareness of that aspect and possibly practicing it um, productively as much as possible will increase their understanding first of all and would be very relevant to learners. So it would be worth practicing it? At all levels is that or a particular level or is that something? I don't see why a, an elementary uh, student uh, should be kept, I don't know, protected from wood yeah. right. if, if they keep expecting wood Mm. In you, it, it will never happen, so it just creates confusion. There's nothing mm. more difficult intrinsically about widget as opposed to wood and you. It's shorter, okay. it's quicker, and I think it's very relevant to so any level. So you drill learners from an early level to, to use those contractions and those, that assimilation, would you? I, I do think it's worth introducing from the very beginning. Mm. Okay. It's, it's a natural piece of language. Um, a last question. Um, Materials and sort of activities for pronunciation. Do you have any particular favourite sources or favourite types of activity you use for pronunciation or books on pronunciation that you found useful in the classroom? The first book that would come to mind would be um, Pronunciation Games mm -hmm. uh, by Hancock. I, I find that the, the way the games are um, designed helps in, in two ways, one for the actual production of the sounds and also it, it makes it less dry mm. um, and it involves the students a lot, whether it's to do with connected speech or individual sounds, there are lots of crossword puzzles and mm. battleships games and um, in my experience students really find them 
are both entertaining and useful. Mm -hmm. there's, well, yeah. 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 there's also um, quite a lot of work on pronunciation in um, the new Headway series. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps different activities from English file. They mm -hmm. seem to be um, quite quite keen on pronunciation work, and they've they've brought out a new edition of books that gives more attention to to this as opposed to grammar and vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thanks very much, Kat.